Welcome. This is the A Course in Miracles Palm Beach Study Group for September 9th, 2021. We are in Chapter 5 in Section 6, Time and Eternity. It's on page 86 in the book. God in his knowledge is not waiting, but his kingdom is bereft while you wait. All the sons of God are waiting for your return, just as you are waiting for theirs. Delay does not matter in eternity, but it is tragic in time. You have elected to be in time rather than eternity, and therefore believe you are in time. Yet your election is both free and alterable. You do not belong in time. Your place is only in eternity, where God himself placed you forever. Guilt feelings are the preservers of time. They induce fears of retaliation or abandonment, and thus ensure that the future will be like the past. This is the ego's continuity. It gives the ego a false sense of security by believing that you cannot escape from it but you can and must. God offers you the continuity of eternity in exchange. When you choose to make this exchange, you will simultaneously exchange guilt for joy, viciousness for love, and pain for peace. My role is only to unchain your will and set it free. Your ego cannot accept this freedom and will oppose it at every possible moment and in every possible way. And as its maker, you recognize what it can do because you gave it the power to do it. Any questions, comments? Well, I'm going to go over it just a bit. So when it starts out saying God and his knowledge is not waiting, well, God can't wait because God's not in time. God is in eternity. But his kingdom is bereft while you wait. Well, bereft is a, an emotional term, and it's kind of used as a metaphor um, to point out that we are the ones who are waiting. What, and what, what, are, we, what are we waiting for? We're, we're waiting for ourselves to make that decision to to get out of time and back into eternity where we actually are and where we belong. It says all the sons of God are waiting for your return as you are waiting for theirs because there's only one of us. And so we're all waiting on each other for ending the ego and coming back into eternal life in spirit. Delay does not matter in eternity because there is no delay in eternity. Eternity is eternity. There's no time in eternity, so there can't be any delay. But it is tragic in time. The delay is, is tragic in time to 
to, to not move forward, to delay, to be stuck in time, to delay uh, overcoming and leaving the ego world and going back into spirit. And it says, you have elected to be in time rather than eternity. It was our free will choice. We're the ones who thought that we could separate ourselves from God. And we put ourselves into this situation. God didn't put us into this situation. We did. We're the authors, the creators of it. And whatever you believe is true for you. And it says, and therefore believe you are in time. We believe we're in time. And so we are in time. If we believe we were in eternity, we would be in eternity. It's our free will to, to decide that. And then it says, your election is both free and alterable. You choose the one thing, you can choose the other. And, and then he just says, you, you don't belong in time. You don't belong in the ego. Your place is only in eternity where God himself placed you forever. That's where we truly are. Thinking we're in time, feeling we're in time, uh, experiencing that we're in time is, is an illusion. It's a dream. It's not real. In reality, we are in eternity. In reality, we are in heaven, but we're sleeping there. And we're dreaming that we're here. And it's guilt feelings that keep us locked in time. We think we're, we're guilty of separating ourselves from God and that God's going to punish us for that. And that induces fear. Uh, or the fear of retaliation or abandonment. And this ensures that the future will be like the past. That's, that's time. Future past is time, not eternity. And this is ego's continuity as opposed to God's. And it gives the ego a false sense of security. Why is it false? Because it's not real. It's only an illusion. It appears that way. But it's not. And if you believe you can't escape from it, then you're locked in it. But you can escape from it. And it says, uh, paragraph two, sentence five, but you can and must. You must escape from this illusion. God offers you the continuity of eternity in exchange. So you can exchange ego for heaven. It's as simple as that. When you choose to make this exchange, we chose to go into ego, into time, into the illusion. Now we have to choose to go back into heaven, into the spirit, and give up. Actually, we're not choosing to go back into heaven because we are in heaven. We're choosing to forget that we're in the ego. We're choosing to forget that we're in time. We need to forget this stuff. Let it go. And it will just dissolve. And when we choose to make this exchange, we'll simultaneously exchange guilt for joy, viciousness for love, and pain for peace. And then sentence eight says, my role is only to unchain your will and set it free. My will, my role, that's Jesus speaking. Jesus's role is to unchain our will. How, how is he doing that? Well, through this course, by teaching us, by teaching us what is truth. He is fulfilling his role of unchanging, unchaining our will and setting us free. Our ego cannot accept this freedom. 
and will oppose it in every moment in every way. And as its maker, that's us, we recognize that it can, what it can do, because we gave it the power to do it. So we have to realize that. That we gave the power to ego, we created the ego, we can undo the ego, just as we created the ego in the first place, we have the power to undo it. Any questions, comments? Yes, Dave. <clears throat> I've been stumbling over uh, how to achieve joy. In, you know, that's in number seven, uh, paragraph two exchange guilt for joy. How do you do that? By, through forgiveness, through the atonement, forgiveness, forgiving, true forgiveness, forgiving it because it's not real and it never existed in the first place. And so when you forgive it, you don't have to feel guilty because you get rid of the guilt when you forgive whatever it is you're, you're feeling guilty about. And then you'll just automatically feel joyful because you will have released yourself from the guilt. I don't know if I have much guilt. That's well, else. that's good then. <laughs> That's good. And again, if you're in a space where you've already released a lot of your guilt, you've already done a lot of forgiveness, then this, this doesn't necessarily apply to you as much as it would to somebody else who's, who's maybe just starting out in this course. And those of us who have been studying it for a while and putting it into practice, putting forgiveness into practice, then we don't we don't feel this as much anymore and and we are in a state of joy uh, like most of the time but everybody's along their own path so so some some are um, are further along than others, but that's okay. How would the Course describe joy? Does it, does it need to? Don't you know what joy is? <laughs> well, I'm not sure. Sometimes, you know, I say it's happiness that I've chosen. Uh, what, what, you know, what comes easy like breath is joy like breath for me um, i guess i'm chasing it away by always looking for an example of joy in my life uh, i guess maybe i need gratitude training and i would feel the joy yeah just just feel it just feel gratitude is a form of joy I, we spoke about this a few weeks ago. There's lots of different, different words we can use to express this. Now, the Course likes to speak of joy, but, but being grateful, being happy, uh, you know, being contented, um, peaceful, you know, there's joy to, in peacefulness. Um, not not feeling anxious or or full of fear, you know. When you're not feeling those things, you're usually feeling joy. And so there's degrees and and there's different nuances of joy, but Is raising our consciousness 
maybe that I'm already doing it by uh, looking for joy. I'm trying to be see joy in my life. Well, I'm going to suggest don't think about it so much. Just just be it. You know, you don't have to intellectualize it. You just have to, you know, feel it. You just have, you know, if you you want to feel joy. You and I know you already do this. Go 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 for a walk in in the woods and or at the beach and and look at the birds, look at the flowers, take in the sun and and don't you feel joy? Don't you feel peaceful and joyful and grateful? Uh, when you, you yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. So just do more of that. That's <laughs> all. So put mm -hmm. put yourself into situations where you'll just naturally. Feel joy and just. Well, I, I take pictures of animals and okay. flowers and things like that, and that's I feel joyful when I do that. Well, good then. So to do do things that that make you happy, that give you pleasure. We're going to go on to uh, uh, paragraph three. Remember the kingdom always, and remember that you who are part of the kingdom cannot be lost. The mind that is in me is in you, for God creates with perfect fairness. Let the Holy Spirit remind you always of his fairness. And let me teach you how to share it with your brothers. How else can the change to claim it for yourself be given you? I'm sorry, how else can the chance to claim it for yourself be given you? The two voices speak for different interpretations of the same thing simultaneously or almost simultaneously for the ego always speaks first. Alternate interpretations are unnecessary until the first one was made. Well, remember, remember the kingdom always, we're, we're part of the kingdom of God and we cannot be lost. So we just need to realize that. And there's only one mind. The mind that is in me is in you. There's only one mind. And God create perfect fairness. We all share that one mind equally. So let Holy Spirit remind you of his fairness. That God loves us all equally. And let me teach you how to share it with your brothers. And that's what you're doing by learning this course. You're learning how to share that mind with everyone else, with your brothers. And that's how you can claim it for yourself. Remember, we, we've talked about earlier that what you give away, you increase that to, to get, you must give. And so when you share this with your brothers, then you're sharing it with yourself. There's only one of us. So there are two voices in our mind though, the ego voice and the spirit voice. And he's saying ego always wants to speak first, you know, and give you his interpretation. But then he ends by saying alternate interpretations, in other words, more than one, were unnecessary until the first interpretation was made. Until we made the ego, there were no other interpretations. It was very simple. God is. That's it. There's, there's nothing else. But when we created the ego, then the ego started 
making its own interpretations of everything. Paragraph four, the ego speaks in judgment and the Holy Spirit rever re reverses its decision much as a higher court has the power to reverse a lower court's decisions in this world. The ego's decisions are always wrong because they are based on the error they were made to uphold. Nothing the ego perceives is interpreted correctly. Not only does the ego cite scripture for its purpose, but it even interprets spirit, scripture as a witness for itself. The Bible is a fearful thing in the ego's judgment. Perceiving it as frightening, it interprets it fearfully. Being afraid, you do not appeal to the higher court because you believe its judgment would also be against you. So here we're talking about all of the hellfire and brimstone that people interpret uh, from the Bible. And there's a lot of fear, especially in the Old Testament. Um, there's even a saying about, you know, uh, uh, the fear of God and, uh, in, in the Bible scriptures, but but that's all ego interpretation. And that's all they're saying here is that if you're going to look at these scriptures through ego's eyes, then well, you're going to find all kinds of, of fear and and judgment and, and all of that. Whereas spirit. Spirit doesn't teach that at all, just the opposite. Paragraph five says, there are many examples of how the ego's interpretations are misleading, but a few will suffice to show how the Holy Spirit can reinterpret them in his own light. So let's see what he has to tell us here. Paragraph six, as ye sow, so shall ye reap. He interprets to mean what you consider worth cultivating, you will cultivate in yourself. Your judgment of what is worthy makes it worthy for you. Um, I, I wish he was clearer here instead of saying he. I'm going to have to assume that um, he is referring to Holy Spirit and not ego, because previously it said uh, a few will suffice to show how the Holy Spirit can reinterpret them. So. As ye sow, shall ye reap, is reinterpreted to mean that whatever you consider worth cultivating is what you will cultivate in yourself. So if you place, if you place a value on, um, on anything negative, being selfish, being angry, any of those things, if you're going to cultivate any of that, then that's what that's what you will, if you consider them worth cultivating, then that's what you will cultivate. So whatever you've, your judgment of what is worthy makes it worthy for you. So that, that's, you know, basically that's just karma. The what you sow, you will reap. You know what you do comes back on you. But karma is just 
neutral in and of itself. It's only if you do negative, does negative come back on you. you. You do positive, then you create positive karma. So if you value joy and you and peace and you then you cultivate joy and peace and then you will receive joy and peace let's go on to paragraph eight then quote i will visit the sins of the fathers unto the third and fourth generation unquote as interpreted by the ego is particularly vicious. It becomes merely an attempt to guarantee the ego's own survival. To the Holy Spirit, the statement means that in later generations, he can still reinterpret what former generations had misunderstood and thus release the thoughts from the ability to produce fear. So from ego's point of view, he's saying that, you know, everybody's going to suffer generation after generation because of what was done and in the ego world, that's very true because, you know, that's that whole concept of original sin. We thought we could be separated from God. And so every generation has to deal with that, with that original sin. And we, and we all are in the ego world. But what he's saying is that the Holy Spirit, uh, though, is saying that well, okay, from generation to generation, there's always another chance to learn, to forgive, to correct the error. So even though the error may be perceived, it doesn't have to be that way. As we continue, we can, we can go go forward and attain the, um, the atonement. Any questions so far? All right, let's see, number nine. Quote, the wicked shall perish, unquote, becomes a statement of atonement if the word perish is understood as be undone, the wicked shall be undone. Every loveless thought must be undone. A word the ego cannot even understand. To the ego, to be undone means to be destroyed. The ego will not be destroyed because it is part of your thought, but because it is uncreative and therefore unsharing, it will be reinterpreted to release you from fear. The part of your mind that you have given to the ego will merely return to the kingdom where your whole mind belongs. You can delay the completion of the kingdom, but you cannot introduce the concept of fear into it. So there, there's an interesting comment here, because what, what he just said was that as we undo the ego, the part of our mind that the ego is occupying, as the ego disappears, that part of the mind is rejoined into our spirit mind. So the more spirit mindful we become, the more spirit mindful we are. And until eventually our whole and complete mind 
is at one with spirit and ego has vanished, has disappeared, has left, ego has left the building. Paragraph 10, you need not fear the higher court will condemn you. It will merely dismiss the case against you. There can be no case against a child of God. And every witness to guilt in God's creation is bearing false witness to God himself. Appeal everything you believe gladly to God's own higher court, because it speaks for him and therefore speaks truly. It will dismiss the case against you, however carefully you have built it up. The case may be foolproof, but it is not God-proof. The Holy Spirit will not hear it, because he can only witness truly. His verdict will always be, thine is the kingdom, because he was given to, to you to remind you of what you are. So this is a, a very important paragraph here, because again, and the book does this repeatedly, this is the promise that, that we're given, that we will re-enter the, the kingdom, that we will be able to, to um, forget the ego mind altogether, that we will be able to become one again, or realize our oneness again, is a better way to say it, because we are already one, we're just not realizing it. So we don't need to fear that the higher court will condemn us because that's impossible. God will never, ever, ever condemn his child, you. Do you have anything, David? Shall I go on? Paragraph 11. When I said, I am come as a light to the world, quote, I meant that I have come to share the light with you. Remember my reference to the ego's dark glass. And remember also that I said, quote, do not look there. It is still true that where you look to find yourself is up to you. Your patience with your brother is your patience with yourself. It is not a child of God, is, is not a child of God worth patience? I have shown you infinite patience because my will is that of our Father from whom I learned of infinite patience. His voice was in me as it is in you, speaking for patience towards the sonship is in the name of its creator. So uh, again, this is coming up because time is an illusion we already are in eternity. So to have patience is, is, is natural in, in that aspect and that, you know, we can, we can afford all the time in the world to work on ourselves, to to get ourselves to that place that, that we need to be of understanding and realization. And we need to be very patient with our brothers in this process 
because again, there's only one of us and whatever we do unto our brother, we do unto ourselves. Did you have a comment, David? Uh, I was talking to my wife and she was um, saying that she has to be more patient. And, and I agree with her, but then I looked at myself and I said, I'm not patient with her impatience. <laughs> so um, I found patience in myself, impatience in myself. And yeah. I always felt I was a very patient person, but um, not in all cases. Right. And, and when you're impatient, it's a, it's a sign of disrespect. That's why I take it. It's a separation. It's not, um, and it's something I have to be more conscious of. Yes. I can't be pointing the finger at other people. Remember, whenever you point your finger at other people, you're pointing your finger at yourself. I see. <laughs> We're on paragraph 12. Now you must learn that only infinite patience produces immediate effect. This is the way in which time is exchanged for eternity. Infinite patience calls upon infinite love. And by producing results now, it renders time unnecessary. We have repeatedly said that time is a learning device to be abolished when it is no longer useful. The Holy Spirit, who speaks for God in time, also knows that time is meaningless. He reminds you of this in every passing moment of time because it is his special function to return you to eternity and remain to bless your creations there. He is the only blessing you can truly give because he is truly blessed. Because he has been given you freely by God, you must give him as you received him. So again, that, that give unto others is what you're giving unto yourself. Sharing the Holy Spirit, sharing love, sharing forgiveness, sharing patience, sharing joy, sharing compassion. That's, that's the key to all of this, and especially sharing true forgiveness. Remember, true forgiveness doesn't say, I forgive you even though you did this terrible thing to me. True forgiveness says, I forgive you because you didn't really do anything to me. That's whatever you did was in the ego illusion. It's just an illusion. It doesn't, it's not even real. I'm not going to hold that against you. I'm going to send you love and I'm going to be infinitely patient with you and with yourself. Yes, David. That's very hard for people. I, I've been practicing. Didn't say it was easy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been practicing it, and I'm getting better at it and trying to set an example for others. However, I feel like I'm alone sometimes. <laughs> well, know that you're not. <laughs> That's true. But uh, it's very difficult. Well, it's only difficult if you make it difficult. 
Does everybody deserve our love? Everybody. There's only one of us. That's right. I heard that from before. You've said it plenty of times before. <laughs> I know. Sometimes it's hard, like you said earlier, putting it into practice. Um, and it is a practice. Yes. Yes. Well, all right then. Um, I think we're, we're at the end of this chapter, so I guess we'll just close for tonight. Unless there's any last comments, David? We are one. We are one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's have a moment of um, silence, please. <clears throat>